So I'm so excited to be here. I talk quite a bit on the Underground Railroad, but this is my first time being in my home region in my own kind of local area to have the opportunity to actually talk about something that I'm really passionate about, um, the Underground Railroad. So my background in the Underground Railroad um, started years ago, shortly after the dinosaurs went extinct. I um, went to graduate school and I uh, was always interested in the Underground Railroad. I was interested in the era of of, uh, ensla of enslavement, of um, reconstruction, of all kind of like a specific 19th century um, United States history. That was kind of like my comfort zone. So um, when I went to Western Michigan University, I had the opportunity to focus on a site, and we're going to talk about that site in just a little bit, but I had the opportunity to focus on a site, and in the process of going through that experience of working on that site and getting to know the descendants of this Underground Railroad community and working with the National Park Service, that really created a love for me for the Underground Railroad. I ended up getting my graduate degree in anthropology or archeology, span which is just a really fancy way of saying that I spent six years learning how to dig a hole with a paintbrush. <laughs> so, hi Noah, hi Blair, come on in, grab a seat. I also invited some of my students to come along for extra credit, so. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, um, just a few, I'm gonna advance our slides here. Whoops. So um, let me move some things around here on the screen. So I have a few sensing questions. So I'm just going to ask a couple questions. This is this is informal. There are no wrong answers. Um, so I just want to kind of get an idea of what we think about um, about the Underground Railroad. But first and foremost, when I say the term civil rights, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Anything. Slavery. slavery, emancipation proclamation, slavery, emancipation proclamation, Martin Luther King. Yep. Martin Luther King. Freedom. Freedom. Anybody? Civil War. Awesome. This is great. I, this might be a really short talk. It sounds like y'all know everything already. <laughs> All right. So freedom, civil, civil war, slavery, Martin Luther King. All right. OK. Um. So what's up? Violence. Yeah, absolutely. You were listening at home. <laughs> All right. So when I how about when I say the term resistance, what do you think of when I say the term resistance? The underground railroad. Cleverness. Cleverness. All right. Survival. Survival. Yeah. Struggles. Yeah. Secrets. Secrets. Yeah. Yeah, survival. Survival. Yeah. Fear. 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 Risky. Risky. This is great. Violence. More violence. Gandhi. Gandhi. Yeah. That's awesome. What's that? Self yep. Self worth. Absolutely. <laughs> you can tell we don't have any electricians in the room. I thought we were going to get a technical electrical conversation about about resistance. All right. So um. So uh, when I say underground railroad. When we just throw that out there, what's like what's the Underground Railroad? What do you think of? Harriet Travel, Harriet Tubman. Quakers. Quakers. Good. A series of places. Quilts. Uncle Tom's Cabin. North. North. Yeah. Northern Escape. Northern Escape. This is great. Constellations. Constellations. Awesome, Seth. Yeah. Anybody else? A series of various places where people stopped and rest on their way north that was set up by several different people at several different times in several different areas. Can you give him a microphone? <laughs> I'm going to go grab lunch. No <laughs> <I'm> kidding. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I, was, I was joking. <laughs> but I appreciate your tenacity. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so so um so I heard the word violence, but I also heard the word Quaker. So do you think it was a peaceful or a non-violent or a violent event, a violent thing? So when we say Underground Railroad, do we think peaceful or do we think of violence? Both Both tried to keep it peaceful. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, right. That, but they're trying to uh, stay out of um, the uh, stay a few steps ahead of the site path here. So yeah. Rapture. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. This is great. I'm. This is. This is great. So, let's see if I can. Whoops. So the Underground Railroad remains one of the most significant movements of civil disobedience in our nation's history. Let's really hang on to that. So this remains, the Underground Railroad remains one of the most significant movements of civil disobedience in our nation's history. That's from Carol Mull. She essentially wrote the book on the Underground Railroad in Michigan. It's literally called the Underground Railroad in Michigan. So, um, so she, we're able to credit her with that. So the Underground Railroad, in I, I, you kind of nailed it right there, right? So it's a, um, it is a network of people, places, events, and movements that aided freedom seekers on their journey to liberation. Were railroads used? Actually, they were. <laughs> they were. So trains were used. Was anything underground ever used? Yes. Right. Cellars, basements, hiding, hiding places. Yeah, absolutely. So the term Underground Railroad comes to us from historic times, from like when the, the Underground Railroad was actually operating. And it was obviously a metaphor. It was a, an opportunity to uh, to imply that this movement was underground in the sense that it was secret. It was clandestine. Right. Um, but it was also uh there, there, what we'll see here in a minute, there, there were advertisements about it where people were really like putting information out there. And they used the term railroad because railroads were hot at the time. I don't know if it was around today. I don't know if it'd be called like the underground Wi-Fi or something like that. But, <laughs> but essentially it's a network, right? It's a network to get people that are resisting enslavement, people that are seeking freedom, from the American South, and sometimes even not just the American South, sometimes even as close as Ohio. There were places in America that were not safe for Americans. And so people were migrating, moving, taking off, heading out, getting anywhere that they possibly could. Even if you were free in states like Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, you still had to carry papers. You had to register. In Indiana, um, in 1853, you had to register with the courthouse if you were a person of color. You had to pay a fee equivalent to about $3,000, $4,000 in today's terms. And you had to pay this fee as a guarantee that you weren't going to be a burden to the state. And you had to produce your free papers. And they would write down that, yes, indeed, this person is free, was born free, or purchased their freedom, didn't matter. But you almost had to provide that money as an insurance policy. And then you had to be registered. And if you weren't registered, if something happened, if you, you know, got pulled over for speeding in your buggy or something like that, then you're going to end up as a violator, right? Was that mandated by the state or federal? That particular case that was in um, Lawrence County, uh, Indiana, um, that was a county rule that eventually became a state rule. So 1853 is a significant date. We'll get to that. Um, but essentially, we have people that were born free. We had people that migrated 20 years prior as far as Indiana. And then all of a sudden, we see them. These are farmers that are people that lived on the landscape for 20, 30, 40 years, pioneered the area and are up and selling their property um, at half what they had purchased it um, for, or I'm sorry, half its value, and moving to Canada. Canada was the only safe place, right? So we see them moving to Canada. Now, eventually, after 1865, we do see some people return. Um, but so a lot of people say, well, yeah, but that's not the Underground Railroad. They were already free. It is the Underground Railroad. So the Underground Railroad is this network that's helping people. So it's it's abolitionists, it is uh, church groups, it is uh, religious movements are probably one of the biggest supporters of the Underground Railroad. It's organizations, it's secret societies, it's all sorts of different people that are coming together and they're doing different things to get folks that are against slavery and that might be feeling the uh, the constrictions of slavery out of harm's way. 
especially after 1850, we see a pretty significant increase in um, people that are not enslaved or have never been enslaved, becoming enslaved, being kidnapped and being taken to the South and sold um, and being enslaved for the rest of their lives um, just because of the color of their skin. So I got off on a little tangent there. So, <laughs> well, uh, so resistance, um, the refusal to accept or comply with something, the attempt to prevent something by action or argument. The Underground Railroad is both action and argument. Again, this is an example of one of our countries, or our country's one of the biggest um, uh, examples or movements of civil disobedience. So when we think of resistance, I heard, uh, what were some of the words I heard? I don't remember now. Gandhi, I remember Gandhi. <laughs> I said clever because it's clever. If, you're yes. not, if you don't have power in a, in a culture, then you have to get around yes. the, law. the law is the law. Absolutely. You have to strategize, right? You have to you have to figure out how are we going to make this work. You have to be extremely resilient. You have to plan. So we have examples of passive resistance in enslavement history, and we have examples of more active or more aggressive. Um, so poisoning farm animals, right? If the farm animals were sick, then you might not have to work that day, right? So we would see people poisoning farm animals, maybe burning biscuits or burning food, right? If you work in the house and you're like, ah, you know, this guy's really ticking me off. I can't stand this master. I might make his food taste a little crappy. Maybe I'll even poison him while I'm at it, right? Like that's always an option. Um, so we also see more, um, more passive things such as uh, fundraising, right? Raising money to pay for people to, to contribute to people's journey, maybe um, maybe sewing clothes. So we see a ladies aid organization out of Northern Pennsylvania. Um, they're out of the local Methodist church. They are spending tons of dollars they're right on the cusp of, uh, of New York and of Canada there. They're spending tons of dollars and raising tons of money to make sure that everybody, by the time they get to Canada, they have fresh clothes. Right. These are people that are on the run with nothing, right? They're not, they're not bringing any luggage. They don't have a carry-on, right? They are on the run with absolutely nothing, no resources to their name whatsoever. So um, different organizations, different groups, different people would show up in the best way that they possibly could and contribute to the movement through what we usually see as a very individual behavior, like sewing clothes, providing food, providing funding. Maybe there's something a little more drastic, like lobbying. So then we see those really aggressive forms of resistance. We see infanticide. It's actually really common, right? So has anybody seen the movie or, or read the book Beloved? It's by Toni Morrison, right? So that book picks up um, and goes on a fictional sort of tangent where a true story ends or at least takes a divergent path. So Margaret Garner uh, was uh, married to another man. She was enslaved. She was married to another man that lived on another plantation. And uh, she had four children. She was 22 years old and had four children. She uh, had been raped by her enslaver repeatedly, and we're not really sure how many of the children were her husband's or her enslavers, but either way, um, she had four children. They plan a big escape. They're all going to sort of leave at, the, at about the same time, that, that plantation that she's on and, and uh, the neighboring plantation. So... Um, they take off, they leave, they make it across the Ohio River. So we have this large group that's together. Unfortunately, Margaret's group had somebody with them that uh, couldn't, they had a, a, a person that uh, had trouble like just walking. And so they were slowed down a little bit. They made it across the river. They ran into bounty hunters. Everybody scatters and runs. Margaret's husband is able to get away with another group of people. Margaret herself takes her four children and she hides out in the woodshed of a home that she thinks is of someone that is uh, anti-slavery. They turn out to be pro-slavery. The enslavers show up at uh, that woodshed. She hears them coming. She grabs the child that's closest to her and she kills that child because she doesn't want, and her intention was to kill all of her children, right? Um, because she doesn't want them to go back into slavery. 
as the story goes, um, of course, she is um, she's held up in the newspapers as a as a monster. And how could you possibly kill your baby? And this is an example of why uh, Africans and African-Americans should be enslaved. They lack rudimentary feelings. They have the ability to kill their own children. Um, when in reality, she couldn't bear the thought of the things that she the people that she loved the most going back into slavery. So she killed her children. She killed one child. She was in the process of killing the others, um, and she was stopped. Eventually, her two children, two of her oldest children, are uh, sold downriver. They escape into the Great Dismal Swamp. We don't know anything about them after that. Um, she has one child left, her little baby. She is sold downriver with her baby, and she ends up uh, in a... Uh, in a boating accident, actually, um, on her journey downriver. And some people say she threw the baby over and then she jumped over herself to try to kill herself. Others say that in the accident, the baby fell over. She jumped in to try to save the baby. Either way, the baby dies. She makes it to a plantation and she dies within three months um, from tuberculosis. Right. So very short life. So when you pick the book up, when you read Beloved, it actually picks up at that scene um, where uh, Margaret is murdering her her uh, middle child. So so that's a pretty aggressive. Right. That's that's a pretty drastic. Drastic times call for drastic measures. Um, so we also see resistance in the form of rebellion, riot, right, mobs. We see escape. We see people escaping under the guise of a mob. And we'll actually see that in uh, in Detroit if we make it there today. Um, so the Underground Railroad really serves as this foundation of resistance. It is a resistance movement, whether you're active in it or you're passive in it. So why Michigan? We have here, we have all these, these kind of like maps and interpretations of uh, the Underground Railroad. Matt, I knew you were coming and I know you like maps, so I really loaded up on the maps. You. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, <laughs> so in looking at this, uh, in looking at these, so we see um, there's really this focus. I'm going to go to this one. It seems less dangerous. Um, uh, so we see this focus here on um, on uh, southern Michigan and these routes, right? There was a, a an attempt in the 1880s to document the routes. We want to find the routes. Where are the routes, right? So um, so everybody said, well, it went through this town and went to that town and went over here and then up there and then down here and all over the place. Um, so we have this map. We have this other map, right, that kind of like shows, again, most of the emphasis is on Detroit. We don't really see too much up here, um, but we do have this line that goes through. Um, this is not necessarily to represent the border between Canada and Michigan. Rather, this is a, another route or another line. And then we have this other one that kind of like loosely throws people like through, I don't know, I'm going to say Oscoda maybe, <laughs> and, uh, and kind of up through um, uh, on the edge of Lake, Lake Erie through Detroit, over through Cass County um, and into, uh, into Wisconsin or into Chicago. So we have all these different options. We have all these different opportunities. The thing that makes Michigan unique Many, one of the many things that makes Michigan unique is that it's this awesome peninsula, right? It's that's okay, Dad. <laughs> it's, it's probably my uncle wondering, what are you doing? <laughs> um, so uh, it's a peninsula, right? There's abundant natural resources. Its location to Canada. If you noticed in the beginning, we said the ticket to midnight. Michigan is called midnight, right? It's what happens just before you get to Canada. Right there, you're right on the cusp, you're right on the edge. We have all of these uh, all of these lakes and all of these rivers and all these places where you can hide and where you, you can sort of live or possibly be or travel through without being found out, right? So between those natural resources, between us being a peninsula, and it's really easy to get lost in 19th century Michigan, right? And um, between our distance to being to Canada, this made us a primo location. We can't forget that at one point in time, Michigan was a slaveholding state in that before it became a state, right? There were slaves in Detroit. There were even more slaves in the UP, or I'm sorry, at Mackinac, at Fort Michigan Mackinac. Right. So slavery, in fact, in uh, 1789, I think it was, there was 101 enslaved females in Detroit and 89 enslaved males in Detroit. 
right? So that was acceptable um, because we weren't necessarily our own government. Um, most of them were brought in either by the French or the British. And they and and it's also would be um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention they weren't necessarily all African or African American. Many of them were Native Americans, right? So Native Americans were enslaved um, by the French and by the British. So um, eventually, we see folks move to Canada, and then we see them move back to Canada from Detroit. So. Canada has this weird relationship with enslavement um, in its early years, just as just as what ends up becoming Michigan does too. So we see people when it's not safe to be uh, in Canada, they move back to Detroit. And then all of a sudden it's not safe to be in Detroit. So we see them move back to Canada. There's, there's one family in particular, we see them move back and forth four or five times over the course of a 20 year period, just because of the politics, it wasn't necessarily safe. So there's also a lot of settlements in Michigan, kind of scattered all throughout Michigan that are uh, anti-slavery. Um, they're pro-abolitionist. And so that makes Michigan kind of a comfy place for many folks to be. Um, and then the biggest thing is the tribes. So yesterday was Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, in the spirit of kind of keeping that conversation going, I want to share a little story that um, hasn't really come out yet. My friend Roy's working on a book, so I'm gonna I'm gonna encourage you when Roy's book comes out if this topic interests you um, to to support Roy um, in that fashion. But let me oh good here we go. Okay cool. So what I want to share um like I said it comes from Dr. Roy Fink and mine who's a uh, an educator in underground railroad studies um, at uh, University of Detroit Mercy. So this is what we know. We think that it was the fall of 1833, and Chief Blackskin, or uh, Chief Makatosha, he's a he's a, a Ottawa chief. Um, he's at a critical decision point. He was in the southern village, located on the Grand River, so what is now really close to the actual rapids in Grand Rapids, right? Um, he's he's in his village, and he has twenty freedom seekers, twenty people that are escaping slavery, that are resisting, show up on the shores of his village. He also knows that there's slave catchers in the area. Now we, we know that this is fall and we're assuming that it's 1833 and we'll, we'll get to that assumption here in a minute. So <clears throat> he has these uh, folks approach him, they're seeking assistance and they want some help getting to Canada. Right, so if we need a geography reminder, Grand Rapids, right, like over here-ish, right, Detroit over here, Canada, easy to get to via Detroit. Um, so Chief Blackskin, he he earned his name, I have to pause for a second, he earned his name, he's a very formidable man, very handsome man, um, and he wore in the wintertime this beautiful black coat made from black uh, squirrels, right, black squirrel fur. And so that's how he gets his name. So uh, he was not impressed with some of his uh, fellow uh, Ottawa or Adawa uh, brothers and sisters in their excitement over white acculturation, meaning he wasn't a big fan of white settlers. He didn't mind the Catholics because they were kind of passive Right. Like the Catholics were like, yeah, you know, you can believe this or you don't have to. But here's this cool pot you want to exchange for something. Now, the Baptists, he had a real problem with. He's like, uh, uh, nope, no. Bat In fact, when the Baptists tried to build a blacksmith shop on the edge of the village, he sent some folks to burn that to the ground. When they tried to rebuild the blacksmith shop, he had that burned to the ground and he kind of had some unsavory things <laughs> occur to, to some of those uh, those Baptist settlers. So uh, he wasn't anything like uh, his Adawa brothers and sisters in the northern village, which was just I mean, it was it was just right up the way. Right. It's not that far away. So he's faced with this interesting situation. Here's 20 freedom seekers and slave catchers hot on their tail. And so he meets with the other elders of the village and he says, these people need our help. It's the white folks that are pursuing them. I'm against that cause and I'm against that endeavor. So let's help them out. Let's create a new way. Let's create a new route to Canada. We're not gonna send them to Detroit. We're gonna take them north. So, 
he essentially communicates, he sends messengers in advance, and he says, hey, listen, I got 20 freedom seekers. They're coming in mass. What can we do? How can these, how can these Odawa villages help out? What will you do? So he has a handful of people, 10 people from Little Traverse area and from Burt Lake area, show up in his village in the southern part of Grand Rapids. It's essentially kind of like where, um, where Grand Valley is now, where the downtown campus is now. <laughs> so he has them show up there. And they essentially pack up these 20 people. And they walk them this entire route back westward and kind of northward, right? Back out to the lake. And then they stop at all these Adawa villages along the way. They stop at Little Traverse. They stop at Burt Lake. They stop at all of these uh, different locations. His goal is to just help them north. Yeah. How did he communicate to these people? He sent messengers. So this is pieced together through oral history, right? He, did you say Wi-Fi signal? Smoke. Oh, smoke signal. No. <laughs> um, so we have to keep in mind how connected. It's easy for us to assume that uh, people were really living in, in some silos or kind of in, in satellite situations. Um, in reality, these uh, villages are getting information from from trappers, from traders. They're connected with all of these other villages um, along the way, all of these ones that they're associated with. So they had sent messengers. He had sent messengers up, and then the messengers came back with additional people. It was interesting. He didn't send his own people, and he didn't go himself because he's really busy burning up the Baptist stuff. So <laughs> um, so he, he felt it was necessary, right? So so they go up, they pass through Charlevoix, they pass through uh, Burt Lake, they essentially make their way north. And by the time they've made it to Mackinac, they have taught those 20 freedom seekers the art of waktan, which is essentially a way of fast walking, right? It's a, a Native American way of, of kind of walking through the woods. So they taught them this art. When they get to Mackinac, it's another, another village picture for you. When they get to Mackinac, these 20 uh, freedom seekers are passed off to eight new people, a group of Ojibwe. So let's pause for a second. Let's think about this. You have been like hustling. You have been walking from Kentucky, which is where we think that these 20 freedom seekers are from. You've been walking from Kentucky and you've come all the way up to Michigan you ended up in the middle of a Native American village that's duking it out with a white settlement over Catholicism versus Baptist, right? And, and then you're hiked through the wilds of northern Michigan on a beautiful fall day. Maybe it was like today. Who'd love to be outside right now walking 20 to 30 miles a day at least? Um, and then you get to Mackinac. And now you're passed off to eight new Native American folks that you don't know. And they say, don't worry, you're going to be fine. They have three war canoes. They load you and 19 of your freedom-seeking friends up in these canoes. And they send you across the Straits of Mackinac for five miles in the cold, in the pitch dark of night. That is a leap of faith. I mean, I mean, really, at this point, you might as well go with it, right? But think about the faith. Think about the trust. Think about, you know what? All right, you know, let's just do this. That's what this was worth to these folks. So they, uh, they, they get on this, they get in these canoes, they travel across, they get to St. Ignace, they rest for the night, they get up and within the next two and a half days, they walk 60 miles, two and a half days, 60 miles. They make it to the shore where they meet more people <laughs> with more canoes, new canoes, right? And they are transported across the water to what's now Nebish Island. And they disappear into Canada. We don't know much about them after that. So we have assumptions um, that they are probably ended up on, um, on Manitoulin Island. 
So we have accounts of Black Indians, what's called Black Indians on Manitoulin Island. We also have accounts of large populations of Black Indians um, in places like Owen Sound, which is a little bit further south, right? Um, so it's really kind of interesting. We don't hear about the stories of Native Americans. We don't hear about uh, the indigenous people's contributions to the Underground Railroad. When you talk to a contemporary, um, especially Anishinaabe, um, Ojibwe, Odawa, Potawatomi, um, uh, historians or uh, oral tradition keepers, they'll tell you, yeah, absolutely. We had a close connection with those that were resisting enslavement. We assisted them, we helped them, we facilitated them getting here, getting to wherever it was. And oftentimes we would accept them into our tribe. Now, just recently, there's been a DNA test, so we can actually affirm that. You know, sometimes you have to wonder, like, well, that's just oral history. Is that really true? Did that really happen? So what's interesting about the DNA, take DNA samples taken from the Anishinaabe, specifically in Michigan, in the Upper Peninsula and in the Lower Peninsula, many of them share a specific gene, and they share that specific gene with very few other populations in the United States but with a very distinct population out of sub-Sahara Africa. So the only other population that, ha and, and we're, we're not talking a little, a little percentage, we're talking an 89 to 93 percentage match, right, between those people that are tested um, and uh, this, this sub-Saharan uh, population. So the only other population that has even close numbers, which is about 50%, are the Black Seminoles in Florida, the Seminole Indian nation um, that absorbed many people um, out of maroon settlements uh, during the War of 1812 or just before the War of 1812. So, so we have the oral history, right? We have some documentation here and there, and now we have this DNA evidence too. We never thought DNA evidence or DNA conversations would come into the Underground Railroad, but here we are. So really kind of uh, fascinating and interesting. So I had a video for this next segment. I didn't want to participate in this thing called Death by PowerPoint. So I had a brief video, um, but uh, we, we can't show it. And so I'm going to provide a summary. So I kind of gave away a little bit of it earlier. You look like you have a question, Matt. Yeah. So I'm going to wait. Till you... <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. All right. <laughs> so, so, um, and I, I do intend, this will be interesting to see if it actually happens. My husband does not have faith that I'll actually do this. Um, I do intend on ending early so that we can have, we can have questions. He knows me well enough to know that, um, my, I have strong jaw muscles. So, um, I, I kind of gave a little bit away earlier when I said that, uh, that for some reason, Chief Blackskin didn't want to send folks to Detroit. Anybody know what was going on in 1833 in Detroit? The first race riot. The first, Detroit's first race riot. Sorry, did I say 1933? 1833. The first, Detroit's first race riot in 1883. And it was over the Underground Railroad. So let me... So we're going to skip this. I'm going to I'm going to do a plug for my friend Jaman though. If you're ever in Detroit, or you want to go to Detroit. Um, Jaman is the uh, historian. He's the official uh, Detroit City of Detroit historian, and the Underground Railroad is his jam. And he will take you to all kinds of great uh, places. So, so we're going to skip him. So um, <clears throat> so. Uh, essentially what happens is there are two people that had escaped again from Kentucky and uh, Lucy and Thornton Blackborn, Lucy's real name is Rutha. I will call her Rutha or I'll try to call her Rutha. Um, so Lucy and uh, I'm sorry, Rutha and Thornton <laughs> escape enslavement. Thornton is a brick mason, right? He's a, a brick and stone mason. He's doing masonry in the city of Detroit. They're living there for probably three, four, five years at least. Um, they're living there and enjoying their life. They have a family. They're doing all kinds of things. And all of a sudden, slave catchers spot them. And these slave catchers, now you got to keep in mind, you don't keep, you don't like come home with any money if you uh, don't come home without the person that you're trying to capture or someone to replace them. So these slave catchers essentially catch the Blackburns, Rutha and Thornton, and they take them to the local jail in Detroit. 
and they say, hey, hold on to these folks. It's like a Friday. Nobody works the weekends, right? So it's a Friday. They're like, hey, go ahead, throw these folks in jail. We'll come back on Monday and get them. Now, all of a sudden, there's kind of some rumblings in the community because Rutha and Thornton were really well known in their community. And Detroit's supposed to be free. Michigan's supposed to be free, 1833. We should be able to live here, right? But the Fugitive Slave Act of 1793 made it so that slave catchers can go anywhere in the United States and capture people. What would end up happening is the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 would make it so that if I was aiding someone in their journey to freedom and you knew about it but didn't say anything, they can come after you now and take your home. They can take all of your resources. They can all of this kind of like terrible stuff can happen to you. It was a really encouragement to rat other people out for participating in the Underground Railroad. So, but this is 1833. So, uh, Ruth is in jail. Thornton's in jail. There's a mob starting to grow outside. They get a little freaked out on the inside of the jail. It's just the sheriff, like another guy helping them out and the two bounty hunters. And so they actually put Thornton in shackles inside. Like That's how nervous they were. They put him in shackles inside his cell. They're not too worried about Ruth. Uh, she's a woman. She's not going to give us much trouble. They're not going to worry about her, right? So two folks show up, um, well, actually a group of folks show up to try to visit Thornton and to try to visit Rutha. They're in separate cells and they get turned away. They're like, no, 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 you can't visit Thornton. So they're like, oh, okay. Well, um, so they send two women back and they said, well, hey, can we, can we visit Rutha? You know, we brought her some food and we really wanted to pray. We're from the church. And so they say, yeah, okay, all right, sure, go ahead. You can see Rutha. She's not a threat. Go ahead. So they get in there and they brought some food and they're having some snacks. They're eating some dinner because prison food is just terrible. And they're um, they're praying and they're reading the Bible. And while they're doing that, they're swapping out clothes. So one of the women, a free black woman, changes her clothes with Rutha Blackburn. They pray some more. They're there for a couple hours. Finally, the, the deputy comes back and he says, hey, closing time, you got to go home, right? This is on Sunday. So, okay. So, Rutha and her escort walk right past the sheriff, right out the front door, and everybody that's out there waiting for her had prearranged this, scuttle her away to the Detroit River. She catches a boat, and she's free in Canada within hours, probably within minutes. The next morning, the bounty hunters show up, Sheriff and the deputy show up. They're getting ready. All right, yeah, we're going to transport these people. We're going to send them back to Kentucky. And the woman that had swapped places was like, surprise! I'm not Rutha Blackburn. I'm a free woman. You have to let me go. And, you know, while you were just, you know, messing around, she escaped. She's in Canada. Now everybody's upset, right? And the slave hunters say, the bounty hunters say, no, you know what? We're going to take you. We're going to take you and we're going to send you to Kent or down to Kentucky, back to Kentucky. And we're going to get some money for you because we need to recoup our expenses. The mob ensues. It is four dudes inside a jail, plus another guy that's in shackles against an entire mob. The mob breaks in. The sheriff sustains an injury that will eventually mortally, it will kill him. Thornton is released from his shackles. He is taken to the water and he is transported in less than an hour and a half to Canada. And they are free. Eventually they make their way to Toronto and they open the, the Toronto's first cab company and they die extremely wealthy, well-connected people in, in Toronto many, many years later. So what's interesting and I just noticed that we have a hand up um, online, so we can we can I'll hold I'll, I'll hold some space at the end, and we'll answer questions if that's okay. So um, uh, we end up. Um, I love your socks, by the way; those are fun. Oh, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so so what we end up seeing here is a, a handful of things. Part of it is the spiritual aspect, right? Part of it is the reliance on religious organizations. Part of it is timing. Remember I said it's 1833? This was the summer of 1833. Remember we talked about how connected some of these folks are? Chief Blackskin knew it wasn't safe 
in August of 1833, or in September or in November of 1833, to send people to Detroit, especially 20 people, that's not going to go unnoticed. Everybody's going to see that. That's a giant red flag, right? So they're avoiding Detroit in 1833. The Underground Railroad is like good jazz. It's improvisational, right? So you have the ability to pivot when you need to. You have the ability to kind of recreate your identity. You have the ability to take a different path, to go a different route. That's essentially what we see them do. I think we have just enough time. I want to share. Oh, yeah, plenty of time. Um, so this is uh, unrelated, but still related. Um, this is uh, so 20 years later in Detroit. Uh, this was uh, a advertisement put out by William Lambert and uh, George de Baptiste. Now, George de Baptiste is a black barber. Uh, William Lambert had purchased his slavery. Um, actually, he had escaped and then ended up purchasing his slavery, um, or his freedom, rather. So uh, this essentially says, stockholders of the Underground Railroad Company, hold on to your stock. The market has an upward tendency by the express train, which arrived this morning at three o'clock, $15,000 worth of human merchandise consisting of 29 able-bodied men and women, fresh and sound from the Carolina and Kentucky plantations have arrived safe at the depot on the other side. They're talking about Canada. At the other side, where all of our sympathizing colonization friends may have an opportunity of expressing their sympathies by bringing forward donations of plows, farming utensils, pickaxes, hoes, and not old clothes. Don't, don't bring your old clothes, man. Give us some new stuff. Um, and these immigrants all can till the soil. They're essentially saying, we just delivered a boatload of people to Canada they're looking for work. They're able-bodied. Please employ them, right? Please give us some money, right? But this is this is a call for donations. And if you were just like walking down the street, passing by, and you read this, you'd say stockholders of the, of the railroad company. You wouldn't think twice until you actually read the fine print about human cargo, about delivery, about all of these other things that are mentioned here. This is 1853, right? So this is 20 years after the Thornton Raid or the Thornton Riot. George and Baptiste, um, has anybody heard of a little known fellow by the name of John Brown, as in Harper's Ferry, John Brown? So we talk about the Underground Railroad being violent or passive or, or peaceful. George de Baptiste, who is one of the forerunners of the Underground Railroad in Detroit, leans over to John Brown in one of his meetings and he says, you know what, John? You need to up the ante a little bit. Really what you need to do, you need to be more aggressive. You need to blow some stuff up. You need to get yourself some guns. You need to show up on a Sunday to all these white churches and you need to go inside and make a statement. You got a pack and full of gunpowder. This is George de Baptiste, right? Obviously this is before John Brown and Harper's Ferry, but John Brown gets the idea or the suggestion of greater violence from George de Baptiste, the leader of the Underground Railroad Movement, one of the leaders of the Underground Railroad Movement in Detroit. So if I were to tell you that the population, the largest population of African-Americans, the largest sort of concentration of population of African-Americans in 19th century Michigan, we're all gonna assume that that's Detroit, right? It actually wasn't, it's Cass County. So if you look over here, Cass County, way down here, down by Kalamazoo, south of Kalamazoo, right on the state line, just north of South Bend, Indiana. So in the 1840s, over 350, possibly 400 African-Americans living in Cass County, compared to Detroit, not even half that in the 1840s. So why Cass County? So we have all these, uh, all these wonderful faces here. These are all actually members of the, the Chain Lake Baptist Church um, in, uh, in Cass County. So Cass County is essentially a hub of black settlement. Even today, it still remains the largest population of African-American farmers. Many of those farmers are well beyond Centennial Farms. Right. So it was an area where folks came and settled. These are free black pioneers that show up. They show up in Calvin Township. And at the same time, we also see a high population of Quakers, Society of Friends. Not just any Quakers. These Quakers actually get punished by their order 
for being a little too anti-slavery, right? They refused to sell anything derived from slave goods or from slave labor in their stores. So they're not selling cotton. They're not selling sugar. They're not selling tobacco. They are funding in mass quantities, large scale amounts to anti-slavery organizations. They are actually, they're accused of going to Kentucky and enticing people to run away, right? And then transporting them. They were accused of this for a long time and we found out that it was actually the Baptists that were doing that. It wasn't the, it wasn't the Quakers, but they were associated. They were all in cahoots. So we see all this activity in Cass County and um, we start to see kind of a curious situation show up. We see this little place that we refer to as Young's Prairie Ramp Town. Now I found a newspaper clipping or it was brought to my attention. It is the only mention of Ramp Town that I had seen when I started my Underground Railroad research. And it essentially said, Aunt Melissa Brown, last known child born at Ramp Town passes away at the age of 70 something, right? And she passed away in the, in the 1920s. And it's a teeny tiny little obituary with the word Ramp Town in it. So we find out that Ramp Town, along with being located adjacent to this huge, large free black settlement. And um, so it's north of this free black settlement in Calvin Township. It's south of this Quaker uh, settlement in Penn Township, kind of right on the, on the line. We find out that Ramtown is essentially this place where uh, folks that were resisting enslavement on their Underground Railroad journey, on their freedom journey, would get to Michigan and the Quakers would say, man, you know what? I own like 600 acres, 700 acres. I got a bunch of kids. I got a bunch of land. I'm trying to farm. I got a little bit of business on this side. How about this? How about you stick around? I'll give you five or 10 acres in exchange for five or 10 years of manual labor. You work for me. Your kids can go to school with the other black kids down in Calvin. You can go to church down there. You can even have another job if you got the time with all of the land that I need to clear. What do you say? Does that sound good to you? And then in five or 10 years or when time, you know, kind of warrants, then you can sort of move along, right? Does that sound agreeable? And a lot of people are like, I don't know, this kind of sounds familiar. This kind of, so like, I'm gonna work for you. I'm gonna live here, right? And I don't actually get to keep any of my stuff, but you're a Quaker. We got a bunch of free black folks. Like maybe this will work. So we see a village sprout up or a community rather. And now this is a rural community. When we say village, we have the assumption there's like picket fences and all these houses right close to each other. They're farmers, right? So they need land to live. So they're kind of disperse in and amongst each other. What's sad about this, well, I mean, it's cool that they're able to, to sort of stop on their journey to freedom and hang out for a while. What's sad about this is they don't show up in records. If I was able to blow this map up here on Penn Township, you see, we just see a few landowners in this entire section, right? We see a tiny little what's probably a house here. The conversation about Ramp Town is that it's anywhere from 50 to 100 cabins. Do you see 50 to 100 cabins, 50 to 100 little squares here? These people are absent from the landscape. They're completely void. They don't hold a title to the land. That's not their land. They don't show up in any transaction records. They don't show up in any, the only time that Aunt Melissa Brown shows up anywhere is her obituary in 1920. This is essentially supposed to be a community of people that made it north via the Underground Railroad. And they went completely silent. They went completely under the radar. Even the name Ramptown, we're not even sure what that came from. If you drive there now, it looks like you're driving through Mikado, right? It's just fields and woods. Southern Cass County, so um, between Cassopolis and Vandalia. Down here. Yeah, yeah, there's yeah, there's absolutely nothing there. I want to spend just a few minutes. I want to leave a few minutes for questions. Um, but I want to tell you about a little event that happened known as the 1847 slave raid. And I'm gonna go through it kind of quick to leave us some space. So this distinguished gentleman here is Perry Sanford. He escaped from Greenup County, Kentucky in uh, the spring of 1847. He is living in a cabin 
on land owned by a Quaker. Um, the man and woman that owned this house here, house is still standing, you can tour it today. Um, Stephen and Sarah Bogue, they were Quakers, anti, um, the Society of Friends. And uh, we essentially have this incident where slave catchers come to Michigan. And they come early on in the summer and they disguise themselves as abolitionist lawyers. And they go door to door in this predominantly black community, right? And they're like, hey, we're trying to get rid of slavery. Could you possibly, like, do you know anybody that was enslaved? Were you enslaved? Do you want to share your story with us? And like, we're going to help. We're going to get slavery gone. And but we need your testimony, right? And do you happen to know so-and-so? We're kind of, we're looking for, so we heard he's got, we heard he's here and he's got a really great story. We want to try to get a hold of him. So he can tell us a little more. Now, right away, right? We have to keep in mind, black folks aren't sitting around waiting for white folks to help them. Black folks aren't necessarily sitting around saying, oh gosh, you know what? This really nice white guy just showed up with a Southern drawl and he wants to help us end slavery. Come on in, right? That's not happening. So he gets a door to the face in most places that he goes. So they change their tactics. They show up as salesmen. They're going door to door selling farm implements or something like that, right? And they get to this area on Young's Prairie in this sort of Quaker-owned area, and they recognize people. So they're like, hey, you know what? We have an idea. They go back to Kentucky. They say, hey, we found them. We found the people that you're trying to to re-enslave, we found your property, what would you like us to do? They outfit these tobacco wagons. Has anybody ever seen a tobacco wagon? It's a big, huge, flat wagon. They outfit it with shackles. Because they say, man, it's not just your guy, but it's like everybody's people. Everybody's people from Kentucky, they're hanging out in this Cass County, like north of the Free Black Settlement, south of the Quaker Settlement. We can get to them. So they show up in August. 40 people show up in August to this settlement and one by one at night, they go from door to door and they knock on the door. Hey, we're here, let us in, right? Now in some of them, now Perry Sanford, he actually recognizes the voice and while he's like crawling out of the roof and then running across the field to Stephen Bogue's house, Mr. Casey, Bill Casey, who was also from the same plantation and had run away, grabs a three-legged stool, lets the enslavers in, pops one of them in the head. He eventually dies from his, from his wounds, from his injuries. Mrs. Casey, his wife, runs into a field. She has her baby. Somebody chases her. They threaten to kill her baby if she doesn't relinquish her, her baby. So all of this violence happens, and it's not just their house. It's, it's not just like this cabin that he's in. They essentially go to 19 different places and they find what they think is 19 people that had escaped from Kentucky, that Kentucky enslavers are paying for someone to recapture. The Quakers, being a peaceful lot, call up the Baptists, who are not a peaceful lot. These are pistol packing Baptists. So um, the Baptists show up, the Quakers show up, them, everybody shows up, right? And they corral together the enslavers and all of the people, all of the freedom seekers, they take them to the courthouse. And of course, the, the bounty hunters are like pitching this great like argument. They're like, no, they're our property. We have the right to take them back. You know, you have to let us take them. So this entire political melee ensues. And they tell the enslavers, they tell these bounty hunters, they're like, you know what? Like, you're going to get hurt. We're going to put you in jail. This is for your own safety. Somebody run downtown, get them some food from the inn. Like, you're going to get mobbed. So we're going to put you here in jail. I know it sounds weird, but just hang out. Bear with us. We'll be right back. We're going to try to take care of this. And in the meantime, 47 people, within a matter of a few hours, get sent from Cassopolis to Vandalia, to Schoolcraft, to Kalamazoo, to Battle Creek, all the way down what is now I-94 in there in Canada within four days. 47 people. And those folks that are in jail <laughs> holding the rightful title to all those people are mad as heck. Of course, a court case ensues. All of those people, including Perry Sanford, stay in Canada for about another 10 years. Most of them end up coming back to Cass County. Perry Sanford lived in Battle Creek where he, he had a nice long 
fruitful and productive life. And this happens in 1847. This is one of the main events that contributes to the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, which makes it even more difficult for people to escape or to aid in the Underground Railroad. So I could talk for seven more hours, but we're not gonna do that. Um, so I wanna pause, I wanna take some questions. I think we have just enough time. Oh yeah, there are a couple of questions. Yeah, absolutely. You showed a map of Michigan. You showed a map of Michigan that named a number of towns east of Detroit, such as Saline and Chelsea. Does that mean that there were stations on the Underground Railroad in these towns? In Chelsea, yes. In Saline, I'm not positive. Um, it may be possible that some of these communities had single or isolated events. Now, there are other places, places like Adrian, places like Frenchtown or Monroe, as we would recognize it today, um, Jackson, Marshall. There's a, a ton of places that, yes, did have, um, did uh, have, or did serve as Underground Railroad stops. It, hi, I asked the question, I, I meant west of Detroit, obviously. But I, I grew up in Saline, and I, as a as a young Girl Scout, toured a home there that claimed to be an Underground Railroad station. I'm wondering if there's any way to to prove that. I mean, they claimed they had a hidden staircase that had somehow been, uh, when the house was remodeled, it was sort of covered up or something. Have Have you heard that? I haven't heard that, um, but that doesn't mean that it didn't exist. So there is. I'm, I'm gonna. I'm gonna fast forward here just a little bit. Um, these are a couple of resources. We'll come back to that if anybody cares. Um, if you dump into Google, you dump in um, Michigan Underground Railroad interactive map. It will bring up a link. And this map is essentially the most current. These are documented Underground Railroad sites. And when I say documented, everybody's like, oh, my house had a secret tunnel. It must have been a house on the Underground Railroad. Um, and then we find out the house was built in like 1940. Um, so so uh, these are houses that have been vetted by a pretty strict process, or they might not necessarily be houses. They might be burial sites. They might be um, historical markers. Um, but they've been vetted by the Michigan Freedom Trail Commission, which is the group that I represent. Um, we're appointed by uh, by the state to do Underground Railroad research and interpret and preserve it, um, but also by the Park Service. So you can uh, you can just dump that in and see if it comes up. Just because it doesn't come up on this map, if it doesn't come up on this map, it doesn't mean it wasn't an Underground Railroad um, location. The beauty of the Underground Railroad research community is that anybody can do it. If you're interested and you have, uh, you know, it's something that you want to explore, anybody can research it. I'm happy to work with anybody that wants to research it. So Jan, I think that was Jan. Jan, if you want to talk more about it and look into uh, researching that location, if it isn't already documented, I'm happy to do that with you. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Matt. Uh, yeah, I was fascinated by this intersection between Native American. Oh, I can speak. I was a teacher, so I can I speak know. loudly. Oh, no, there we go. <laughs> Great school. Oh. Cheryl. Oh, it's old home week. Uh, I'm fascinated by the uh, um, the interaction between Native American and African American. Yeah. And uh, so and the route is through the Manitoulins. And there's a uh, there's a greater Manitoulin, and a lesser Manitoulin. Colburn Island is the lesser Manitoulin. And then there are two Nebish Islands, too. Oh, OK. All right. the east and west Nebish. Oh. I'm fairly familiar with the, that area. And uh, so what I've, I've been reading a book about uh, Colburn Island, which is Little Manitoulin, there was a Native American group in the um, southwest portion of that island. And it, it would. Be, and so there's this big interaction between the Scottish settlers mm. who were primarily initially fishermen. And there's separation between the North Shore and the South Shore at about the same time. And I'm just wondering, were there any uh black native americans in uh in on colburn island i don't know about colburn island um but i think it's worth 
checking out. I think it's worth chasing out. Um, Roy, I got most of that research on on that um, from Roy Finkenbein, and he's in that okay. process of writing that book. He's fascinated, and he's willing to to chase out just about anything, as am I. So um, let's. Huh? I think I know what you're going to do with your retirement. There we go. Uh -huh. oh. <laughs> I have a plan for you, Matt Uncle. <laughs> Seth. Um, so, right in the So, uh, Ramp Town, it just, the citizens just, ex except for that one obituary, all disappear. Are there any hypothesis or theory what happened yes. to the population of Ramp Town? That's a wonderful conversation. And we call it Ramp Town. Ramp Town was the name that folks gave to it, as far as we can tell, after its existence. Um, I usually refer to it as Young's Prairie Ramp Town because it, it, it happens on the landscape of Young's Prairie. Um, so we don't really know what it was really called, um, at least at that point in time. However, uh, essentially, between the what happened in 1847 and uh, in between a change in land ownership, the, the Quaker that owned that landscape um, in uh, essentially in 1852, um, we see, or we think we see, and this is the only, this has been the only archaeological research into the Underground Road in the state of Michigan was at the Young's Prairie Ramp Town site. So um, what we find is that people were probably there for 10 to 15, possibly 20 years. And then it appears that they kind of fizzled out. Now, all we really have to go on is this archaeological evidence and then also maps. So when we look at 1870, we see a railroad bisect that area. Um, and what our assumption is, what we believe our kind of foregoing opinion is, is that after 1865, there wasn't a need for that level of protection anymore. Um, these folks grew up. Some of them, uh, Melissa Brown's dad ended up serving in the Civil War. He was in the Michigan 102nd Colored Infantry. Um, we see people sort of be absorbed into the local community, the people that we do know about. Um, they just absorbed into the local community and they don't live on that Quaker land anymore. So there isn't a need for the settlement anymore. And it just sort of falls to the wayside and disappears. This is farmland. It was always intended to be farmland. It was never intended to be anything else. Um, so these homes are temporary. In fact, when Perry Sanford's talking about his escape, there's at least people from five different families living in one of those cabins. So they're almost as if they were, while they say they were for five to 10 years in five to 10 acres, there's an assumption or maybe a question about maybe these are more like transient housing, right? People are kind of coming and going and using them for much briefer periods of time. How things are remembered and how they're told, two totally different things. Yes, I have a question. Uh, two things. One, I lived in Clarkston for quite a while, and it's right close to Novi, yeah. close to uh, Kensington. Yeah. And I was always told Novi was renamed. It was really number six on the Underground Railroad. Do you know much about that? I do not know much about that at all. I feel that Novi's history is older. Um, the... the the scary part about naming a place like station number six, um, that's going to get out, right? And so folks are going to like be really attracted to a, a place like that, mainly enslavers and bounty hunters. Yeah. Um, so, but um, I have heard of activity in Novi. So whether the name was station number six or not, um, I, I think it, I would assume that there was something there. That was a that was what was passed on. Which was major east west. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah. Detroit. Yeah. Detroit has so many in, in you know, in greater Detroit, so many stories, so many awesome stories. What percentage did the railroad play? Sure. <laughs> Yeah, um, so we have these stories, we have these really interesting stories of, uh, like, in Ohio, for example, on now the Wayne National Forest in southern Ohio, um, you had uh, major shipping and uh, furnace moguls, you had people that owned large-scale industry, and they would employ Africans, African Americans, people resisting enslavement, if they controlled the railroad, you'd see them transport people. Like, because it's their railroad and they can, right? So they would like move people. Um, usually like railroads were, were, they would certainly use the railroad track, right? But they might not necessarily use the train just because once you're on it, it's difficult to get off. It's easy to be seen. 
Um, but uh, it did happen. You know, there was a, a couple from, um, uh, what's the name of the town? It starts with a, at Mason. Um, there was a, a, a family actually from Mason, um, and it was a white woman and a black man that had fallen in love in the South. He was enslaved. They made their way north on a train and eventually settled in Mason. Um, and uh, they said that he was her servant. Um, they were actually a married couple. It's actually happened uh, several times, but you hear them traveling by train because one of them has the ability to pose as someone that would be on a train, right? Any other questions? Right. So the question, but yeah. I, I, I grew up in right, right here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Talked about some. Oh, I do I have to say it again. <laughs> Franklin Farmington. They talk yep. about underground. There was, you know, we all talked yeah. about it, and yeah, that would be related to Grand River Avenue, I imagine. Absolutely. Area. So, uh, Franklin, Novi, Farmington, Birmingham. It's a little bit further yeah. out there. Um, all of those areas, right in there. There, um, in fact, there's a cemetery called Oakwood. It might be in Birmingham, actually. Um, but Oakwood lights up for under people that either assisted, either escaped via the Underground Railroad or um, served as abolitionists of the Underground Railroad. Um, Oakwood Cemetery just has a ton of folks buried in it <laughs> that oh, are okay. affiliated with the Underground Railroad. Our local librarian had an, a Zoom meeting I saw a couple years ago, and she said that people weren't hiding um, enslaved people escape in their homes. They were hiding them out in their land. There was a lot yeah. of land. Yep. And so they, yep. that's where they were hiding them, yes. not actually in their homes sometimes yeah. in that area. More flexibility and versatility on the landscape yeah. versus being trapped in a house. Yeah, interesting. If you're interested in learning more, I'll, I'll come back. If you're interested in learning more, these are just a couple of resources. I mentioned the Underground Railroad in Michigan by Carol Mall. If you have a young person in your life, nine to probably 13 years old, this book just came out. It's called Hinges by Cynthia Millen. Um, it is told from the perspective of an 11 year old girl on Underground Railroad, not necessarily in Michigan, but she is in Northern Ohio. Um, January Sparrow is a wonderful book. It's a children's book. Um, uh, has uh, good artistry. Uh, some of the scenes are a little scary. Um, however, it is based on a true story that took place with the Cross White family in Marshall, Michigan. These were folks that resisted enslavement and then slave catchers came to get them and the town um, fought back. So it's a uh, it's based on a true story. Uh, the Dawn of Detroit by Taya Miles. I mean, there are a, a gajillion books out, especially about um, these interesting topics, but uh, Taya Miles, takes a close look at Detroit, at Mackinac, at the 1700s, if you want to go far back, um, and at slavery, and um, at that kind of fluid frontier that we know of um, as that area in Detroit um, and in those suburbs of Detroit, people moving kind of back and forth. Um, there's also a book called Fluid Frontier um, that I would really encourage folks to read. And there's a new book out, and I think it's called Into the North, possibly. Um, and it is a... a uh, kind of about Michigan and Canada and Ohio. Um, it just it just came out like within the last month and a half, um, and I've heard rave reviews about it. I haven't read it myself. Matt, you had another question. Well, I, I don't want to hold everybody up, but I, I'm curious about the Quakers and the underground, the Quakers and the underground railroads, because of the uh, the way in which Quakers embraced equality. And I just wonder, did Native Americans? Uh, I'm sorry, did African Americans embrace uh, Quaker. Quakerism? Yeah, yes. black Quakers. Yeah. Um, so uh, some society of friends will say, no, there are no black Quakers. Okay. Um, the black Quakers say that there were black Quakers. <laughs> uh -huh. And um, in Cass County, in uh, Porter Township, we actually see the Quaker, the abolitionist Quaker um, folks, they end up taking on 52 manumitted. Uh, formerly enslaved people on Christmas Eve in uh, 1853. Um, and most of those people end up going to church with the Quakers. So whether they officially become Quakers, uh -huh. Black Quakers, you know, it's hard to tell. Um, but uh, that... Uh, you always associate yeah. ba the Baptist right. tradition with... Right. Uh, and of course it was, but right. the... Uh, the, the AME. The, the, the Calvinism that infiltrates Quakerism, I mean, that's essentially comes out of the mid-17th century. Um, um, 
the Puritan movement. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you don't really associate that style of Christianity mm -hmm. uh, with right. African Americans. Right. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know why uh, there would wouldn't be that, that crossover but yeah it seems that there are pockets now whether it's politically recognized like i told you the quakers in cass county got in trouble for being so ardent in their beliefs um whether it's isolated and it happens here and there um the cass county quakers were amongst the most abolitionists you know they're traveling to the world conference um on abolitionism in in england and they're funding yeah. you know nationwide efforts yeah. so um in that slave raid of 1847 in Cass County, most of them end up losing mass amounts of land and money to the point where they're like putting a call out. Um, and we do see local black residents responding by giving them money yeah. and saying, hey, thanks for helping out. Let's try to get your land back. Right. The loyalists in Canada in the connection with the Wedgwoods and the early, yeah. right, the early 19th century uh, abolitionist movement that really and slavery uh, in the first part of the century, whereas in the United States, it takes another 50 years. Yeah. Yeah. And war. And mm -hmm. war, right? I could have talked for another two hours about the yeah. Michigan's 102nd Infantry, <laughs> the Colored Infantry, but we won't do That'll that. Be another time. That'll be another time. <laughs> Thank you. It's been wonderful to hang out with you today.